So, we are looking at the various components of the earth system first, the oceans, cryosphere, terrestrial biosphere and the earth's crust and mantle, we completed that and then we looked at the hydrological cycle where in the last class we looked at uh, the um, residence time of reservoir okay? and then we looked at uh, the draining of a lake, okay? precipitation is falling on a uh, catchment area or a basin and then this rain, uh, this collected water is going to the lake the lake and the basin are having different areas and then we are looking at the height z then we got an ordinary differential equation and then we try to get the steady state what is the relationship between what is the relation relationship between the precipitation the evaporation and the two areas and then we solve the unsteady part of the problem where we found that finally the height of the lake varies linearly with the forcing okay v varies linearly with time okay so i also discuss some cases Briefly, I also briefly mentioned some cases where uh, the shape of the lake can be non-uniform, then it is a response, okay. As it starts raining, uh, the z may go non-linearly with t, okay. So, I told you that the model can get very complicated. You can have m incoming streams, n outgoing streams, okay. You can have a spatially varying rainfall, spatially varying uh, evaporation, temporarily varying uh, rainfall, evaporation, all that you will get a complicated model. This is essentially, uh, this is done in the area called hydrology, okay. Next coming to the carbon cycle, so we went through these slides, so for the sake of completeness, we will quickly go through so that there is continuity. So the basic difference between the hydrological cycle and the carbon cycle is the chemical transformations are involved, okay. Chemical reactions take place in the carbon cycle, whereas there is only phase change which is taking place in the hydrological cycle, water to water vapor, water vapor to ice and back and so on, okay. Carbon cycle is of interest to us because it is very, it is a major player in the regulation of the earth's climate and it also regulates two very important gases namely carbon dioxide and methane both of which are greenhouse gases, okay. So we saw this uh, view graph in the last class where there are major carbon reservoirs of the earth system. So we listed atmospheric carbon dioxide, methane, biosphere, trees, then earth's crust, fossil fuels and so on. Look at this fossil fuel. Uh, carbon in fossil fuel is about 10 grams per meter square, 10 kilogram per meter square of earth's area, okay. Earth's area is 4 pi r e square, r e is 6000, 6.37 10 to the power of 6. So 10 into 4 into pi into 6.37 10 to the power of 6 is good, is good. But uh, <laughs> whether it is, how long it will last and other things, we are just, in, in 5 minutes we are going to work out a problem and see and uh, check for ourselves. All right. There is a there's lot of organic carbon in sedimentary rocks. So in our lingo, it's a, there is ajar. Okay, there is ajar uh, organic carbon in sedimentary rocks. Maybe some technology will come to pull out that we don't know. Later on, if everything is there, so there's lot of reserve there. Of course, ocean dissolved carbon dioxide. Then we also talked about the carbonate and the bicarbonate, which are in decent numbers. Inorganic carbon in sedimentary rocks is basically eighty thousand. Uh, kilogram per meter squared, okay. So, this uh, residence time, 10 years and this thing and so on, some people ask a question, so how will you measure and this thing and all that, right. So, what I will do now is, I will quit this uh, presentation. Is there something called carbon cycle research paper? Okay. How do we make this big? Control. Good. Works. Huh? Okay. So for those doubting Thomases who are having doubts, sir, how this is measured and all that? Where is that girl? She asked. He also asked. How do they measure and all that? So, I was just looking at before coming to the class. So, for some people it is bread and butter, it is their life research on these topics, okay. 
For example, this is a paper which says uh, in, a, in a journal called Global Bio Biochemical Cycles, carbon-13 exchanges between the atmosphere and biosphere. So, uh, it is all highly technical. Basically, they are using an atmosphere-ocean coupled model okay, and they look at the fluxes and then you change the fluxes. Okay. If you change the fluxes, you solve the equations for various values of fluxes, you find out what will be the atmospheric carbon dioxide over time and all that. Now, that atmospheric carbon dioxide over time is a measured quantity. Now, you keep fudging these fluxes and solve your governing equation. So, it is a combination of measurements and these fluxes and find out when at what value of these fluxes will the model match with the measurement. Then you say, so it is an inverse problem and then you say this will be the exchange. Like that they have done for each of this. Okay, there are many papers. You just Google it up. How to measure? How to measure the carbon exchange put in the atmosphere? You know, some so many papers will come. So, 2,000 people cited this paper, 100 people cited this paper, and so on. Okay. So this is the way they do it. For each of this, there is a, so there is a model, and there is also a right. So we are getting back to this. Like that, like that, you can get a residence time for each of this. All right. Okay. So, if you want, you can take down this picture, otherwise, I am going to send it as a presentation to you, uh, PDF. So, the atmosphere and oceans, biosphere, crust and mantle. So, this gives you an overview of the cycling of carbon between various reservoirs. At the top is basically atmosphere and oceans, at the bottom you have the mantle. From the atmosphere and oceans up to the biosphere, you have the photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is taking place in the terrestrial biosphere as well as in the ocean, the phytoplankton. Okay. Then respiration and decay, after respiration and decay, from the biosphere it can again go into the atmosphere and the oceans. Right? After the phytoplankton they die, then they will sink, it will go down. Okay. In the atmosphere after something dies, you can burn and that will also go, okay. that carbon will go. Now, from the biosphere, if it is buried, in the biosphere it is buried, it goes down further, it is possible for after many, many, many years it can go down to the crust. In the crust some weathering can take place and this weathering, okay, if uh, can take back some carbon again into the atmosphere or to the oceans. There will be some calcium carbonate, calcium silicate rocks in the oceans and which will be continuously on because of weathering, it may enter into the atmosphere, into the oceans and so on. Then from the crust to the mantle, mantle we already saw, you can have sea, force, uh, sea floors sp spreading as well as subduction. We saw this plate tectonic theory where they are moving with respect to each other they are uh, moving towards each other, they are moving, moving away from each other, there is shear and so on because of all this some uh, seismological activity is taking place and so the, there could be exchange between the crust and the mantle. And finally, there is a direct route, there is a direct visa for uh, this carbon from the mantle to the atmosphere that is through volcanic eruption. From deep inside, you can get this using when there is a volcanic eruption straight away because of this volcanism or volcanic activity, you can get. Uh, carbon can be, uh, carbon and other aerosols can be ejected directly into the atmosphere. In fact, some people say that sulphur aerosols, if they are ejected from the, sulphur aerosols, if they are ejected from the volcanic eruptions in the mantle, then there, there will be an antidote to the carbon dioxide and they will reduce the global temperatures by 1 or 2 degrees. So, whenever there has been a ma major volcanic eruption, the subsequent years we have had, we have had a dip in temperature. So, one model for example, what the Americans would like to do is this sulphur aerosol, you just carry it in 100 or 1000 planes and put it all over the place and then you still burn carbon. So, if you want to do this, this is a new field called geoengineering. You engineer the weather or you engineer the climate. Okay. It is a very expensive solution, uh, but it is possible. Okay. For example, the Chinese have engineered the weather to delay the to stop the rain in the Olympics, right? They, they did that, right? Or you can engineer the weather such that it drains the previous day and all the moisture is drained. So, it does not rain the next day and so on. Okay. All right. Carbon in the atmosphere. Carbon in the atmosphere is mostly in the form of carbon dioxide, right? Carbon dioxide is relatively well mixed in the atmosphere. So, because of its chemical inertness, it does not react so easily and because of its well mixed nature, which arises as a consequence of its chemical inertness, it is distributed uniformly throughout the atmosphere. So, the carbon dioxide concentration is pretty pretty much the same whether it is in the United States or in Asia or in Australia or wherever. But however, there is a caveat there, there is a rider there. This should be away from forest canopies and thick vegetation cover. 
because if there is a forest canopies and thick vegetation cover because of heavy photosynthesis there may be an increase or decrease uh, there may be a change in the carbon dioxide because of heavy photosynthesis activity if you remove that if you remove this from the data points then the variation in carbon dioxide is less than 1% over the entire globe this is remarkable right that is why that keelings measurements on mona loa are highly valid because that is representative of the average carbon dioxide concentration the whole of the earth surface okay ch4 methane is only a trace gas but is chemically very active okay you do you know that ch4 is released when rice is produced rice yes when rice is produced ch4 is re released so ch4 enters the atmosphere mainly through escape of natural gas in mining operations and pipelines it also enters through the anaerobic breakdown of organic matter okay much of which is uh, human induced through activities such as production of uh, rice and livestock cattle and all this through cattle also lot of ch4 natural gas is released okay ch4 has a residence period of 9 years and is removed by the oxidation reaction simple ch4 plus 2o2 is co2 plus 2h2o it is simple single carbon hydrocarbon is the simplest okay which results in less uh, pollution the heavy heavy big chain hydrocarbon the heavy hydrocarbon c8 c10 c12 and all will will result in dumping of more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere okay yes this was a problem which i already discussed in the previous class from the what is it from the volumetric analysis of atmosphere atmospheric air and the mass of elemental carbon in atmospheric co2 estimate the atmospheric concentration so problem 9 Uh, we got the solution as it's 384 parts per million okay this is continuously increasing so if you are doing radiation calculations if you are trying to do a climate study And if you're trying to get the average temperature of the Earth using carbon dioxide concentration, you can have future scenarios where instead of 384, you put 394, 404, and so on, and you can find out what is the change in the temperature because of this. This is called studying of forcing. This is a radiative forcing. If you study the forcing through carbon dioxide, or you can also study the effect of forcing by the increase in atmospheric uh, increase in solar radiation or insulation. You know, not insulation. You know this. incoming solar radiation if it changes how much will it change in all this okay now please take down problem number 10 so this is a problem uh, wherein we get an idea of the amount of time for which we'll have possibly fossil fuels for different scenarios okay problem number 10 The present rate of consumption of fossil fuels is about 7 gigaton carbon per year. The present rate of consumption of fossil fuels is about 7 gigaton of carbon per year. Based on the data given in one of the tables based on the data given in one of the tables how long would it take to deplete the entire fossil fuel reserves? Okay? based on the data given in one of the tables how long would it take to deplete the entire fossil fuel reserves i am giving you two scenarios a if the consumption continues at the present rate what is the present rate 7 gigatons carbon per year giga is how much 10 to the power of 9, 9. and it is gigatons so it is 7 to 10 to the power of 12, 12 kg 7 to 10 to the power of 12 kg per year so scenario a is if the consumption continues at the present rate b if the consumption rate increases at a rate of 2.35% for the next 100 years and then it remains constant thereafter therefore it is intrinsically implicit that i am expecting that it lasts for more than 100 years otherwise part b would become irrelevant Huh? Got it? Hmm. So, A. If consumption continues at the present rate, 
B if consumption rate increases, consumption rate increases at a rate of 2.35 percent for the next century and remains constant thereafter. Okay. Please start solving. consumption rate of per year. Huh? Did you say that? Ah. consumption rate is known. So, if you have to find out uh, how long will it take to deplete, you should know the total amount of carbon, uh, I mean the total, uh, I mean fossil fuel. Okay. So, what is the fossil, total fossil fuel reserve? How much is it? Yeah, you tell me the steps is equal to 10 into is it 10 kg per meter square? So, if the total reserves in kg and the consumption rate in kg per year, kg divided by kg per year will give you so many years. So, I think you get a decent number. Okay. So, what how long what is it? What what do you want to write here? Something is equal to 728, what is that? Time to time to deplete, okay. So, if you consume petrol and diesel and kerosene and stuff at the same rate at 7 gigatons carbon per year, it will stay for 728 years. Then why are people crying so much? The problem is it would not stay, it is not staying fixed at 7 gigaton carbon per year, it is actually increasing because the increasing is contributed by the growing, by the development and growing economic prosperity of the world. Just look at the number of cars, look at the number of cars in Bangalore, more than people I think, correct? The number of cars is more than, okay. So, if that is the case, then this seven, our 728 years is a very, very highly optimistic situation, okay. 
but if you uh, have some inject some growth rate into it now you will see that it becomes deadly let us work, please work out the part b of the problem where you have got a variable consumption rate okay and i have given a modest increase of 2.35% which is based on some previous data we should not go by what they are consuming in japan us germany and all that so average there are some african countries where still cars are very limited so global average some 2.35 okay now part b variable consumption rate what do you work it out what is the consumption rate in the first year okay so how do you how do you proceed no integrate sum of gp correct so you will get a geometric progression so what are the numerator and denominator 1.7 a a r2 to the power n minus 1 by r minus yeah what is the n 1.0 it for the first 100 years i said no so it is easy otherwise n has to be found out means it is a terrible okay so total consumption in 100 years let us start like this okay that is a good idea okay one One point zero two three five to the power of ninety nine. Why hundred ninety nine? So this is a GP geometric progression. Okay, what is that value? What is the expression for sum of GP? A into R two power n minus one by R minus one. What is A? One. Seven is already there. One is one. R is one point zero two three five whole to the power ninety nine. Whole to the power hundred. 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 Whatever you say, this is correct. Sorry, hundred. Ah. Divided by point zero two three five. Yes. How much is this? It is less than the total available. Ah, two point, two point, two point seven four into. Okay. The good news is it is less than whatever is available. Okay. At the end of now, at the end of hundred years, you have to find out what is available. Correct. That is the next part.
What is the total sum? Mm. Now, you have got a uniform consumption, uniform rate of consumption, consumption. that uniform rate of consumption is 7 into 1.0235 to the power of 99, correct. So, there is studness in the problem, okay. you have to pay attention. So, you have to find out at the end of 100 years, what is a consumption rate. Then divide this, divide this by the consumption rate at the end of 100 years to find out how long you can sustain after 100 years. Then you you will get a number, add 100 to it that is the total number of years and common sense tells you that it must be less than 728 years because you have got an increasing rate of consumption. You just do it. Okay, how much is this? How much is this? Six point six three. Ah. What are the units? Kg per year. Hundred plus. You did by thirteen. Hundred and. So, with just a 2.35 percent increase, the 728 years has come down to 135 years. Okay. So, this 7 into 10 to the power of 12, it has become 6.99 into 10 to the power of 13, that is 69 into 10 to the power of 12. That means, it has or around 10 times. Okay. You know what is the doubling time? What is the doubling time? You have not studied any finance or economics? 
okay doubling time what is the formula for doubling time doubling time is 72 by n where n is the simple interest so if a bank gives you a simple interest of 12 percent in 6 years your money will double if it gives an interest of 6 percent which is compounded you do not pull out the interest it will double in 12 years 72 by n is the formula okay so this 72 by n 72 by 2.35 is about 34 35 years itself it has doubled okay in 70 years it will quadruple in 100 years it will become some 8 time whatever but it is not 2 it is 2.35 so it may change this is okay fine now so this gives you an idea of uh, the scary situation just change the 2.35 percent to 3.35 percent okay it will make a big change to the numbers okay so the challenge is to the challenge is to be able to make the systems more fuel efficient look for alternative fuels hybrid vehicles electric vehicles photovoltaic solar thermal solar photovoltaic whatever or what have you okay right now carbon in the biosphere in the biosphere is basically trees plants and all this now on shorter time scales large quantities of carbon dioxide carbon pass back and forth between the atmosphere and biosphere basically because of photosynthesis burning and all this right now photosynthesis re uh, reaction is basically carbon dioxide plus water gives rise to a carbohydrate H2CO plus O2. So the photosynthesis reaction as you all know produces oxygen which is the elixir of life okay. So this photosynthesis is largely responsible for the sustenance of uh, life on earth okay. So the above reaction actually removes carbon from the atmosphere and store it uh, and stores the carbon in an organic molecule which is basically the car carbohydrate and uh, in, in where in both phytoplanktons in the marine biosphere as well as in leafy plants in the biosphere okay. Now the opposite reaction is basically the respiration and decay reaction where either there is decay or the food is consumed and it is burning in oxygen and then this results in carbon dioxide and water vapor. So this is an exothermic reaction okay it results in the production of uh, heat energy okay. So in this reaction the organic matter is oxidized and CO2 is released back to the atmosphere okay. So in photosynthesis CO2 is absorbed from the atmosphere in the respiration and decay reaction CO2 is released back into the atmosphere. During photosynthesis phytoplankton and plants absorb energy in the form of visible light at wavelength 0.43 micrometer uh, and uh, 0.66 micrometer which is orange. So you look at the electromagnetic spectrum we will look at it in a more detailed fashion when we come to the chapter on uh, atmospheric radiation. So we normally use the term uh, the term or notation lambda to know uh, to denote the wavelength in micrometer meter is uh, too big for us okay 0.4 to 0.7 this is the visible part of the spectrum so here you have got infrared here you have got ultraviolet okay so infrared will be up to say 100 micrometer okay and we know that E equal to H nu so as the lambda increases as the lambda increases the energy level decreases so then you may have to but this is basically used for communication right. If lambda is very small you got high energy so this is basically high energy radiation x-rays 
gamma rays and all this which is of interest. So usually point 0.1, point 0.1 into 100 is of interest particularly to mechanical, chemical, aerospace engineers and largely mechanical engineers. So mechanical engineers are interested in the reasonable part of the spectrum, physics people are interested in one asymptotic end of the spectrum, the communication engineers are interested in the other part of the spectrum. Why are we interested in point 0.1 to 100? Because from the Wien's displacement law, you know that lambda max into T is 2898 micrometer Kelvin. Do not think I am reeling off formula one after the other, I will derive, we'll derive this later on. So, for the temperatures which are encountered in mechanical engineering, normally the radiation which is emitted is in the wavelength of 0 0.1 to 100 micrometer. Now, this 0.4 Bib Gior, right, violet, this is red, okay. Blue is very close to this 0.4. So, here we say that the photosynthesis basically the absorption is in the 0 0.43 micrometer which is the blue and 0 0.66 micrometer which is orange, which is orange which is very close to red, all right. Now the respiration and decay reaction release an equivalent amount of uh, energy in the form of heat. So what we can do is how do we measure this, how do we measure globally the amount of photosynthesis which is taking place and all that. So this can be done by mapping it with the help of satellites, so this is called remote sensing, okay. So you can compare the intensity of the reflected radiation at various wavelengths in the visible part of the spectrum. So whatever is coming from Saudi Arabia will be quite different from whatever is coming from the Amazon. Um, there is no vegetation in the Gulf, okay. So by looking at this uh, reflected radiation in the visible part of the spectrum, it is possible to estimate the photosynthesis. This is what is done by both phytoplanktons and land plants. Phytoplanktons are the plants in the ocean and land plants and we get an estimate of what is called NPP. Net primary productivity of the earth, okay. So what we get is, so NPP leafy plants. So we can't call it as a measurement, it is a satellite derived estimate. Okay. I will show you a picture in the next slide. You can see enhanced marine productivity is clearly seen in the region of the equator in the regions of coastal upwelling where nutrients are brought to the surface. But generally as you can very well guess, the net primary productivity is more over the land rather than over the oceans, correct. And then the greening of the northern hemisphere in spring and summer after the rains, the greening of uh, the northern hemisphere pulls out a lot of CO2, correct, because photosynthesis takes place because of which and uh, this is stored in plant biomass which is subject to, to decay at a more uniform rate because of which if you measure, if you have a satellite derived estimate of NPP during spring and summer and autumn and winter there will be a difference. This was and this results in the change in carbon dioxide that is why if you see mono lava people had this, one is a spring and one is a summer. So it is a very clear variation within a se seasonal variation that is because of the greening and the photosynthesis activity which is different in winter than from summer, okay. Now I will show you this picture, I will give it to you, do not worry. So this is the net primary productivity kilogram of carbon per meter square per year. So what can we see about from this, where is it highest? Amazon, okay. So it is highest in Amazon, South America. So here also it is very high, you can see all along the equator here, Indonesia, Singapore, what is this Papua New Guinea is it, Papua New Guinea all these places where it is very high. So this is Sahara, uh, obviously the productivity is very low, okay. 
But sub-Saharan uh, Africa, you got this Kalahari Desert, all these, all these, okay, rhinos and all this. If you want to see, so there, there is good uh, net primary productivity. Europe, America, and Europe also, you can see, there's a good uh, productivity. As I told in an earlier class, it is because of this Gulf Stream and all this thermohaline convection and all this, which is bringing warm waters. Okay, therefore, this climate is okay. Okay. This side is basically the, this is the North Atlantic Ocean, correct? Uh, I am not making a mistake, right? So, this is the North Atlantic Ocean. So, it is results in equitable climate. So, this, as you can see, there are regions where dark color is there over the ocean, where there is a increased productivity, but oceans largely you got this magenta color, which is very low net primary productivity. Land, it is wherever there is forest, it is better. Okay. So, these are basically satellite derived estimates, but you can see since satellites are working for the last 30 years, once in 5 years if you take the data and get a time series, you can see whether there is an afforestation or deforestation taking place. If you have a high resolution satellite, in fact, you can also detect forest fires from satellites because the reflectivity will change and this thing will change and what the radiation reaching the top of the satellite will change. Okay. Now, carbon in the biosphere. So, the exchanges which are taking place because of the greening of the northern hemisphere during summer and spring is responsible for the pronounced annual cycle of the Mauna Loa time series, which I have indicated here. Okay. CO2, so this is what I am talking about. The rate of carbon exchange is measured. Marius, the rate of carbon exchange using some formulae and inverse uh, measurements and models is uh, found out to be 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 kilograms of carbon per meter square per year. So, therefore, the typical residence time of carbon dioxide will be so, what is the capacity of atmospheric carbon dioxide? 1.6, 1.6 kilogram per meter square now. The exchange is between 0.1 to 0.2 kilogram carbon per meter square. Let us take an average value of 0.15. So, the residence time is 1.6 kilogram per meter square divided by 0.15 kilogram carbon per meter square per year and so finally, the answer will be years that is the time it gives approximately 10.6 years. That is why in the table I would not have put 10.6, we would have put a much simplified 10. Okay. Like that, it is possible for you to calculate the exchange rate for various reservoirs and find out the residence time. So, if you if you burn, if the jet engine exhaust is there in the stratosphere okay, today, 20, 21st August, huh? 22nd August 2014, 22nd August to the, up to 2024, it will be there. Okay. So, so, this is an important thing you have to bear in mind. Okay. So, the bad news is if large quantities of carbon dioxide are injected into the atmosphere instantaneously, the concentration would remain elevated at a time interval of nearly 10 years. So, whatever you do, you have already injected so much, it will be there for 10 years. As you keep uh, your consumption is increasing, then you are uh, pumping out more CO2 into this. So, then because of this more CO2, more greenhouse effect, increase emission, then the increase absorption, then increase the temperature, increase the melting. So, decreased reflectivity is changing. So, it has got a feedback, it has got a positive feedback. As far as CO2 in the this uh, in the marine biosphere is concerned, as plants and animals and decay, they die, they go to the ocean floor. Okay. So, the CO2 is actually transported downwards, okay. it goes along with the dead uh, organism. So, this is actually a biological pump, it is very important. This biological pump helps in not increasing the atmospheric CO2, it is not going up. Therefore, this is something which they are trying to replicate and what is called sequestration, carbon capture, carbon capture technologies. They want to bury all the carbon in the ocean, right? This is, this is one of the technologies. So, this biological pump helps in not increasing the atmospheric CO2, which would have been close to 1000 ppm. For example, all this dead matter were to dissolve in the surface itself, the ocean ppm 
concentration of CO2 would have been 1000. What is the danger? What is the difficulty with 1000? The, the water would become so acidic, it will be carbonic acid. Okay? CO2 plus H2O will give H2CO3 which is carbon, carbonic acid. The carbonic acid will, what it will do to the euphotic zone would be, it will quickly dissolve all the world's coral reefs. So, it has got lot of ramifications, alright. Carbon in the oceans, okay. So, we have looked at carbon in the biosphere, then carbon in so far and now carbon in the oceans. Carbon in the oceans basically three types, the dissolved carbon as carbonate, the dissolved carbon the dissolved carbon as first carbonic acid H2CO3 and bicarbonate ions and also as carbonate ions which are basically paired with calcium and magnesium which are coming from the rocks, alright. Okay. Please take down these reactions, CO2 plus H2O gives you H2CO3, okay. let, let me write it down. So, this is basically then H2CO3 can decompose ionize CO3 2 minus eh? HCO3 minus. Then oh, these are all forward reactions HCO3 minus becomes H plus. Now we can add carbonic acid, bicarbonate ion, carbonate ion, okay. Anything else? CO2, correct. CO2, okay. yeah. did I put it as 1 plus 2 minus 3, yeah that is in the reverse, okay. so let us add 1 plus 2, We are putting it in the other form, correct? Correct? Now we add, correct? Ah, so which all get cancelled? Which one here? The LHS. I do not understand. LHS. What is the last reaction? Is this? H plus, H plus, plus CO3 2 minus H CO3. Yeah, okay. What did I write? Both is zero bicarbonate. Okay, okay. Gives? Yeah. Now, what are the things? H plus is getting cancer. Then H2CO3. So, what do you get? CO2 plus H2O. CO3 2 minus gives? Huh? Very good. Charges are balanced? Ah, okay. <laughs> All right, 1, 2, 3, 4. So, there is a lot of activity going on carbonate, bicarbonate, carbonic acid, all these, right? These are uh, 
So, the funda is the dissolved CO2 equilibrates with the atmospheric CO2 okay, on the surface of the ocean. So, to a limited extent increase in CO2 can be buffered by the bicarbonate reservoir. So, the bicarbonate reservoir acts as a boon to us, it, it captures all the CO2 and put it as a bicarbonate and keeps it, it does not release it into the atmosphere okay, or into the ocean. So, marine or what this bicarbonate it would not keep quiet, what this bicarbonate does is the marine organisms incorporate bicarbonate ions into their shells and skeletons okay, which have got calcium. Okay. Uh, in the shell and skeleton you got calcium. So, calcium C A 2 plus reacts with the bicarbonate 2 H C O 3 minus and results in the formation of limestone C A C O 3, the funda is there. See how carbon is getting into the system and then again it releases the bicarbonate. So, this bicarbonate will continue with this activity, uh, sorry the carbonic acid right C A C O 3 plus H 2 C O 3. A fraction of the C O C O 3 created through the above reaction it settles on the ocean floor and forms limestone okay. So, the carbon dioxide which you are producing very nicely it settles down as limestone into the if you have a technology to convert all this and make it settle in the limestone then we can burn as much carbon dioxide as we want, but we do not have the technology now. So, limited extent it is able to manage are able to understand that. So, the carbon is finally going into the ocean floor as limestone. This is not the only, there are other rocks, there is a calcium silicate. So, there is a silicate story which is also coming. We will complete that and the remainder what happens is, so a part makes results in the formation of limestone, the remainder reacts, the limestone reacts with carbonic acid and again uh, to through the reverse reaction and uh, through the reverse reaction again releases calcium 2 plus ions. This actually the C A 2 plus ions are also derived from weathering of calcium silicate rocks. The calcium silicate rocks can also react with the uh, uh, carbonic acid and this will again result in C A 2 plus. The C A 2 plus is very important because the C A 2 plus goes and captures the C O 2. So, the sources of this are okay there is an organic source for C A 2 plus and an inorganic source for C A 2 plus. The organic source is the dead skeleton and this thing and bones and all that. The inorganic is what is available in as calcium silicate. So, both of these contribute in making of this limestone and all this and capturing the carbon dioxide. So, if you want to mimic it and do it artificially, this is a carbon capture technology. Okay. So, C A 2 plus ions are also derived from the weathering of this thing and you again get a bicarbonate plus SiO3 plus H2O. Okay. Combining A and B, we get calcium silicate plus carbonic acid is CaCO3 plus SiO2 plus H2O. Then CO2 plus H2O gives H2CO3. Now, let us combine these two. We will, I think this should be the last slide. So, What is happening now? That is it. Huh? So, the calcium silicate is also capable of absorbing the carbon dioxide and it will return it as limestone plus silicon dioxide. However, the limestone formation is limited by the availability of calcium ions which is basically determined by the weathering of calcium silicate rocks and some calcium which is coming from the decay, death and decay of these organisms.